Good to have you this morning at Heritage Baptist Church Bible Study. We are recording this for us, and we're glad to have you with us. We continue in the book of Mark. And uh, it's, uh, you should be here You're in person. It's way better in person, all right? You don't get to see the people. But uh, Mark's an interesting book. Mark uh, starts it out by saying uh, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he gives you a statement, just plain out, this is what it is. This is... I'm not trying to appease your feelings. I'm not trying to... He just said, this is what it is. This is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is it. And I want to start from where it started and we'll go from there. And of course, if you start from where you start, you would too. It's, he said, as it is written in the prophets, behold, I'll send my messenger before thy face, which shall pair thy way before the Lord. Now, when you get down there, you'll find that when we go back, we'll cross-reference it in a minute. It's Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 3. An interesting thing about the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah is like a miniature Bible. There are 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah, and they cover the Old Testament stuff really well, and the prophecies coming into the New really well, all up to chapter 39. It's because that's how many books there are in the Old Testament. When he starts the 40th chapter and moves on, and by the time he gets to the end of the book, the chapter, the 66th chapter, he's talking about the new heavens and the new earth and all that. It's like from there he starts putting more and more references to what this New Testament is going to teach us in it. So it's kind of like a mini Bible for you to read. He has pretty much everything. He has more uh, prophecies of the Lord Jesus than anybody else in the book of mm, Psalms, a little bit close, but Isaiah's got it way out of the deal. And he talks about John the Baptist, and, and that's where he starts. It's written in the prophets, Behold, I send my... And the word prophets is good, because he's... The, Isaiah said that, and then Malachi said that. And if you read both of them together, uh, the Lord was right when he said, If you had believed, this would have been Elijah. And you'll figure that out later on when you get there, when you read through it. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Read your Bible more, Okay. And we want to talk to you a little bit about that today when we're going through this. We, uh, Mark, uh, of course, is a great picture there. He was younger. He was um, eventually died. I think he died in Cyprus, okay, as an older man. Don't know how he died. Most of those people were serving the Lord one time or another because of the conflict of the religious people and the worldly people and the Roman government. A lot of them were persecuted and found out and killed on purpose, okay? Uh, introduction to the book of the outline. This is our second week into this. Jesus' genealogy is not given by Mark. He's just going to start right out and talk to you about Jesus. Anybody got an idea why? Why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you give it? Who, the two books that have the genealogy in, in the Gospels are Matthew and Luke. Mark and John don't have the genealogies. Anybody want to give an idea of that? Why? How about, go ahead. I was going to say, I don't think it needs to be repeated again. Well, this was not repeated. This is the first time. Different what? Different, Different audiences. audiences. Well, actually, it's how you portray the person. If you want to prove he's a king, you better come up with his genealogy. Right? If you want to prove that he's human, then you got to come up with his genealogy. But if he's human and he's a servant, because that's the way Mark portrays him through the whole book, who cares about the genealogy of a servant? A slave. And John does the same thing because he just starts out and says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. Well, God don't need a genealogy, so you don't give it to him. And so the Gospels are written According to what they, they portrayed of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was the king of Israel. He was the perfect man, the born without, from, not from Adam, but from God. In the book of Luke and in Mark, he's portrayed as that servant. In John, he's portrayed as God in the flesh. So it, it wouldn't matter. Somebody said, what, would, what would Jesus have been if Mary had not been his mother? Nothing. He'd been some, somebody else. He's the only human in the whole world that has a right to reprimand his mother. I bet he didn't. Well, one time he said, woman, what have I to do with thee? Now, because she's going, 
I'm your mother. And the answer to that is, any virgin, he would still be who he was. See, I can't say that. I owe my whole life to my mother and my father, and if one of them married somebody else, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have another dad or another mom. I wouldn't be here. I'm a product of those two people together. The Lord Jesus was before he was born. Before Abraham was, I am is what he said. Okay, so those are pretty good. He declares that he and all others declare Jesus both Lord and God. And he starts out with these. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And by the way, I, 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 want, I want you to understand, when the, a lot of times, and I've heard people say it, and I've heard preachers preach it, that when Jesus was saying that uh, God was his Father, that they, the Jews didn't know what he was talking about. Now, first of all, if you say that, you don't know much about the Old Testament, because in the Old Testament, he's, God is called the Father, I don't even know, 8 or 10, 12 times, okay, the Father. But if you look in John chapter number 8, in verse number, Jesus is talking about them, the Father, the Father, the Father. Look at verse number 41 in chapter number 8 of the book of John. He said, ye do the deeds of your father. And he meant the devil. And I'll show you that in the next verses. Because look at verse 44, you're of your father the devil. But they didn't mean that. Look what they said. Then said they unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. They had no trouble understanding what he was talking about. If you don't think so, look over there. And when he said, he said, Why are you trying to kill me? And they said, Because you make God, yourself the Son of God, or equal with God by being the Son of God. Now that seems strange because they understood it the other way. Now, Mark, the beginning of the gospel. Good news. The good news is you don't have to die and go to hell. The good news is you can have a relationship with God. Now, I understand. How many of you have insurance on your car? I do too. How many have insurance on your life? How many have insurance on your house? Salvation is not an insurance policy. It's an assurance promise. It's an assurance promise. If the only thing you got out of being saved was you get to go to heaven when you die, you don't understand what God wanted. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Well, you know what? What if Cheryl and I, we just produced kids by the dozen, but we didn't raise either one of them. We just threw them out as soon as we had them. They would still be ours, right? What's the hardest part about having a kid? Raising them. It's easy to have them. Harder parts raising them. What is the greatest thing you want to do? I told my kids this morning, I'm going to use this. See how God watches this, Gracie? You and Laney watch. I said, you guys, are a, when you're here, you guys are a lot of problems. Didn't I say that? Didn't I? Yeah. I said, all kinds. You want me to name of something? I have the most talented grandkids in the whole world. I am not kidding. You know what talented people do? They make messes. They're cutting up something. They're pasting something. They're drawing something. They're building something. I, I wanted to show you some of their talent. Like, who is it? Lainey's doing the house, right? She's building a modular house, building the, all the furniture herself, from, not from the, but from scraps of stuff that are around. And she's got room for a bedroom and rooms for a kitchen and rooms for all this stuff. And she's, that's tremendous. But everywhere she goes, it looks like a, a shredder's been through. You know what I mean? Gracie's the same way. They, I'm, I'm telling you guys, they, uh, I, they have talent and they do stuff. Every grandkid I have has some great talent. I don't have all that stuff. I don't have any artistic ability. They, they didn't get mine. Okay, I don't have that. They designed designer dresses and sew them for their Barbies. I can sew a button on a shirt. Okay. I don't have that. 
You say, well, there are a lot of, yeah, they are. But I said, you know, think about it. Here you are, you're this much trouble, but you're this much joy. Ain't that what I said? You're this much joy. Now, I didn't talk about the Monroe's or the Newcombs that are coming. Oh, oh, oh. You know what I mean? And so, you got to think, yeah. And any time in your life as a Christian, guys, that you say, my Christian life should have no trouble in it, you're done. I'm going to have a kid and they're never going to do anything wrong. You're sunk. I'm going to get saved and sail away to heaven. It'll just about be in there, except, except you won't be there. Jesus said in the world, you're going to have temptation. Getting to the heaven part, you know, the, what, that's wonderful. I'm looking forward to that. What about you guys? Until you think about something else. How many of you have lost relatives, lost friends, lost sisters and brothers, lost children, lost... Okay, you understand once we're gone, you can't witness to them anymore. You know, that's somebody else's job anyhow. No, it's not. And John's going to prove that through you through this book. He's going to give you the good news. If you got good news and you don't share it. Did you see what the pizza guy did? What was it, in Illinois last yeah. week? Was that some? Yeah. He was delivering a pizza to one house, saw another house on fire, knocked on the door. They, they was, the, their kids, were, I guess, were there home by themselves. And the house got what, three of the kids out? And they said, our older brother, he went back in the fire. And they got video of him carrying the last kid out of the, of the deal. I don't know if they give you awards. For, you think some, the pizza guy go here is an extra buck for saving a bunch of kids. No, you don't. We have a responsibility sometimes to do stuff just like that. And as a Christian, you have the good news. You found the answer. You, you can live in this part of your life if you want to. But all this part of Christ is still out here and the wonder of it is still out here. You deal with this part. In the world, you'll have tribulation. And Mark wants you to understand from the very beginning, he's not telling you things don't go bad. He's telling you that sometimes you've got to make decisions you don't want to make. You know that wonderful uncle of his, that Barnabas guy? that was the first missionary with Paul and all went with it. And he's willing to separate from the apostle Paul just to help Mark. What do you think Barnabas thought about it when Mark went back to work for Paul? Anybody think he would, well, praise God for that. There's always something that continues on out there. All right. I can see him writing a letter to his sister. You want know that dumb kid of yours done? You know, after all I did for him, okay, you, you always got this in your lifetime. He's, he's going to start out telling you that you've got Christ, but he's going to remind you through the whole book. I mean, watch out. Chapter number three, verse 11. And, and the unclean spirits, they understood who the Lord was. It didn't change them. You understanding who the Lord is, look at chapter 3, verse number 11, if you want to look at it. And unclean spirits, when they saw them, found them before him, cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. You know what he started out saying? This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Okay, and so now he's going to say, he's going to go through his book all these different times and tell you what other, what other people think about this and what the spirits do. Now, I'm going to tell you something. How many of you understand how much lost people believe the Word of God way more than we do. They do. They spent years and years getting it out of our schools, out of our courts, out of our public arena. You know why? They're scared to death of the Word of God. Christian people don't even learn the verses. We're hoping God remembers who we are. The world's scared of it. The devil's terrified of it. The Lord could defeat him in, an, in a disagreement over whether or not he could do certain things or not in the book of uh, the Gospels because and Jesus just took stuff out of three chapters of the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. But everyone he answered him, you know, man shall not live by bread alone, Deuteronomy. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, Deuteronomy. Now, 
One of the verses the Lord, the devil tempted, told him with those, he said, the angel's given charge. This is your verse, Psalms 91. But he took, he quoted it, but he took it way out of context. I'm going to take you up to the top of a temple and let you jump off and see if you live. Well, the verse says that you don't dash your foot against a stone. You don't dash your foot against a stone jumping off the temple walls 200 feet high. You dash your foot against a stone doing what? Walking around, doing what you're supposed to be doing. Now, I, I'm, I'm, see, the Word of God's a great, wonderful thing, but it's only good if you apply it to your life. The centurion who crucified him did. Mark's the one who wrote down and said, When the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. What do you think it made him think that? Well, what he was there for, the thief did on the cross. Remember what he told the other thief? He said, we're here justly. This man has done nothing wrong. The theme of it here is, is the focus on Jesus as the perfect God-man servant. And, and I'm telling you, how many of you guys are servants? See, we've lost that in our Society. We don't want to be servants. We want to be semi-worshipped. That's not what a servant does. Every really good father is a servant. Every really good mother is a servant. Every really good grandfather is a servant. That's what we are. Every Christian is a servant. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That makes you a servant, right? Well, he's writing about the Lord. If the Lord Jesus Christ loved his father like he said he did, then what would he be? He would be the father's servant. One thing about the prodigal son, when he came back, he, he said, you know what's better than starving to death in the pig pen, doing what I want, living as a servant, under my father doing what he wants. And you say, well, if you know the story really well, you say, well, yeah, he got all of his stuff back. Nope, he didn't get anything back. Because the father tells the other son, he got his inheritance and he wasted it. And all that I have is yours. Mark records 19 miracles. Watch what he does. 19 miracles, only four parables out of all the parables in the Matthew and Luke and John. By, by the way, what is a parable? I was taught in Bible college, it's a earthly story with a heavenly meaning, right? Uh, I'll tell you what it is. It's, it may be half that. The other half of it is a riddle. Because Jesus would say, it's not given unto them to know. So I speak to them in parables. I'm telling them the truth. They just don't understand it. Do you ever wonder if, if the parables that he told were actual stories that happened? That he heard? Well, some of them were. You, you can always tell the difference between a parable and an actual story. In a parable, he was, starts this way, a certain man. But when he tell an actual story, there's a man named Lazarus. It's not a parable now. That's one of the easiest ways to do those things, okay? And so that's, uh, the, and if you get that mixed up, then you don't have any explanation of heaven and hell and salvation and separation and security and all that. Because that's one of the great answers we have in Luke 16 when the Lord told us what it's like in the Old Testament, where they were and what they were doing, okay? And uh, someday we're studying that, we'll go through it. Mark records Jesus as the Lord God. And by the way, remember this real quick for me. Capital L-O-R-D means what? Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. It means not just God. It means Jehovah. That God. When you put capital L-O-R-D, it would be the same as us saying God. In God. Now, when I say God, 
I mean Jehovah. And when you pretty much are like me, you know, we say I was praying to God the other day, and you know, I'm pretty sure you aren't talking about some bullheaded man-bodied thing on the other side of the world. But that person over there is. That's a that's a big difference. Remember telling you a lot of times in English it's hard to get things because you it's hard when you when it's small L O R D, small all the way around. What? Oh. Capital a small L O R D, then it's just whoever's in charge. The Lord of the manor of the guy that's in charge or the whatever he was. Sometimes they'd say, My Lord, or what they're talking about. But anyhow. We don't, we don't do that much anyhow. Thank God for, I love being in America, don't you? I'd like it. Does it mean Americans are any better off than anybody else? No, they're all lost till they're saved. He records him as the Lord God, the servant and the savior of man. Mark records Jesus as the one who came to serve while being worthy to be served. That's hard on us. Nobody lacks servant training. Did you ever notice that we don't like servant training? My kids want them to teach. They want me to teach them in teen class about how to be soul winners better. Let me tell you what that starts with. If you're going to try to win somebody to the Lord, you got to think about every little detail. You ever try to talk to somebody who just ate raw tuna for lunch in there in your face with lots of garlic on it? Come on, y'all looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. You know what I mean? You know, who would think about, we'd have to, you know, if you're going to talk to somebody about the Lord, you need to make sure your breath don't smell like elephant's breath. So how do you know being close to an elephant? Mm -hmm. you, you, you see, you say, well, I'm not doing that. They don't like the way my breath smells. Bless God, they just die and go to hell. Guess what else? Can you imagine on the way over to knock to your door, I have an encounter with a skunk and he sprays me. Hey, I want to talk to you about Jesus. Now you would say, okay, I'll stay here and listen to that. The way you smell. You say, well, preacher, that's just too much. That's what I'm telling you. Nobody wants to be a servant. See, a servant obeys whatever it takes and stays within the rules of whatever it is because we have an, we have an intended end. We, we learn to say really good. You know, if you walk into the house, you go, this is about the nastiest house I've ever seen in my whole life. I doubt you go much further. I walked into the house one time and there, the lady, I've told you this, and there was this picture of this beautiful woman on the wall. And I go, whoa, that's a pretty lady. That's a nice picture. I said, who is that? She said, that was me. Oh, yeah. Must have been a glamour shot. But anyhow, okay, didn't go well after that. But anyhow, but I didn't say, well, it don't look like it. See, servants have to do a lot of things to themselves. When I first started soul winning, I had let my sideburns grow down, grow out to my mustache. I didn't have a mustache, just the sideburns. One of the first places I went, an old lady said, you can't be saved and have sideburns like that. So I'm not listening to you. Shut the door. I went home, shaved them off. Went back. She said, I'm not listening to a smart aleck, so shut the door again. But she ain't going to tell anybody is because my sideburns were more important than me telling her about Jesus. It's not. I become all things to all men that by any means I might save some. That sounds like a Bible verse, don't it? It is. See, that's what a servant does. You know what, the, when it, what it took for God? to get us to heaven, his son had to become a creature 
and become the lowest of creatures. He wasn't born in a palace. He was born where a farm animal was, in a barn. He didn't have servants. He didn't have people that waited on him. He didn't have any of that stuff. Most of his life, he slept outside of a house and he told the guy that wanted to father him, he said, foxes have holes, birds have nests, the son of man hath no place. Every time he's at Jerusalem going back and forth to the temple, he's sleeping overnight over in the Mount of Olives outside in a deal of olive trees. Finally, he had a family that would take him in, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, who allowed him to come and stay at Bethany, which is about six or eight miles from Jerusalem, when he would pass through there. <clears throat> He's the one that came to be the serve while being served, would be worshipped as creator and God. Now, see, that's kind of tough. See, I believe that. I do too. That'd be hard to get across to everybody else, though, wouldn't it? Now, John's preparation for the Jesus ministry starts in John chapter number one. I'm going to read this and then we're going to talk to it a bit, little bit. In the book of Mark, chapter number one, I read verse one, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare thy way before thee. Who is that? John the Baptist. John the Baptist, that's right. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, if you went back to John, they came out and said, who are you? To the book of John, they came out to John the Baptist and said, who are you? And he's, are you the Christ? Are you that prophet? Are you Elijah? He said, no, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. When the Lord's ministry was established and everybody knew who he was and where they came from, and John was put in the prison. They said, you know what? He's baptizing way more people than we did. And Jesus, John had one answer. He must increase and I must decrease. See, I've done my job. And I'm going to have to be out of here. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for remission of sins. Now, I can't help but teach you this one more time, okay? John's baptism wasn't Christian baptism. He was baptizing Jews who would repent to go back to following the Old Testament law. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And the first time the Lord sent his disciples out, they went out to preach the gospel of the kingdom, the Jewish kingdom that Jesus could have set up if they had believed in him. We don't preach the good news of a kingdom. We preach and teach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Eternal salvation by the sacrifice of the Son of God for us who loved us and gave himself for us. See, that's what we're preaching. Okay, it's a different thing. In that gospel, Jesus said, when you go out, if they don't want you there, just shake off the dust and keep moving. But see, we're not told that. And you can't use that verse. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going I'm to talk to somebody and say, you want to get saved or just die and go to hell? Nah, I don't care. See, that's not what, that wasn't the answer for us. We have missionaries and a whole bunch of people, a lot of places. And you are. That reception's not great. See, you're, you're not, you say, I'll just shake out. No, you don't. Because you're not preaching that same gospel. You're preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. That's better than the good news of a kingdom that's different. Do you understand that real quick? And they went out. And so they went out all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with girdle of the skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes, that shoestring, I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Does anybody here believe anybody but John and Jesus understood what he just said? 
I don't think anybody did. They didn't quite get that. And it shall come to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan and straightway come up out of the water. Now he leaves out a part. What part did he leave out that Matthew puts in and Luke puts in? The part about John saying, hey, I, you don't need to be baptized of me. I need to be baptized of you. But Jesus said to him, suffer to be, because it had to be that way if it, that's what he was going to do. I'm going to. I'm going to do what I'm called to do. Now, here's my rule, okay? Any kind of statement, any place of leadership in any place in Christ, I don't care who they are. If they don't do it, they don't have a right to tell you to do it. What do you think? If they're not doing it, they don't have a right to tell you to do it. I don't have any problem with anybody teaching me anything and how to do it, but I want to see the people that practice it. When I was in East Fort Worth, I got a guy came by my church and he was he had this program how to fill up your church building in one year. And he had this program how to do it and everything. And I got to know him and Ed called him in and we went over the deal and I said, OK, let's. Let's do this. And I said, I got him. We, we talked about it. We looked at this stuff. I bought some of his books. I still got some of them. But I said, here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to teach me. I want you to show me. And I'm, I'm serious. I want to show me how to do this. I never could get him to go with me. I said, go with me. I, I, I want to go door knocking with you. I want you to show me how to do this. I want you to show me how to how to get all these people saved and how to make sure that they, they come under a, a teaching program and all of them follow after this and all to do it. I want you to show me how to do it. And I'm serious. If I had somebody that do that for me right now, I'd, I'd have them show me how to do it. And he finally said, well, you know, brother, I, I really can't do that, but I can sell books. Okay, I'm not, I wasn't quite as experienced as a new pastor as I am right now. And so now I would say, there's no way you're going to get everybody. If Jesus couldn't do it, you're not going to do it either. Part of it's by what you see. I have a friend of mine who's never seen a coyote. I have a feeling they're looking for something to size, the size of a great Pyrenees. I have a niece that has two great Pyrenees and their heads are about this tall and their bodies are about that tall. I think both of them weigh about 260. Huge dogs. Wonderful things. That's not the way a coyote is, okay? Most of the time, my kids have heard the coyotes around my house since they've been there yelping. And I go by about once a week and clean up the evidence of where they've been in my yard. Okay? But most of my neighbors have never seen one. If you're going to see a coyote, you got to go where a coyote is. you got to go when a coyote, you know a coyote is going to be there. You've got to be able to know what you're looking for. You ever try to show somebody a deer on the side of the road and they can't see it? There's a deer! I didn't see nothing. No, oh, there's four of them! I didn't see nothing. All right. That amazes me all the time. When Tommy was little, I took him deer hunting with me. He hated going hunting with him, but I made him go. Now he complains, you never took me hunting. I said, after you told your mom that you hated it, and I didn't want, I'm not taking it anymore, all right? But it was a, I, we had a, I had a little platform tree stand. We are up, North Texas, and uh, we're there. I got him up in the morning. You usually go early in the morning. Sometimes if if you wait till like noon o'clock to get out there, you probably won't see anything, okay? I have friends of mine who smoke. They've never seen a deer. Others drink coffee on the stand. They've never seen a deer. Others play music. They've never seen a deer. And can I go forward? Okay. I probably not. You know what I mean? That's sort of like, you know, looking for a hippie at Camp Lejeune. You're not going to find a whole lot there. 
look, so I got him out there and I, I picked out his outfit. It's dark. We get him up in the tree. He moves. He's moving. He's moving. He's moving. He's moving. He's moving. He ain't just moving. He's got on one of the, he, he didn't bring the clothes I gave him. He gave the ones his mom bought him and he had bought one of those coats that you, you move. It goes, <laughs> you ever seen those coats and all that? That sound like you're rustling sheets of paper. <laughs> and it goes, be still, boy, you're sounding. Everything's a, be still. We got to get job. Be still, be still. All right. In a minute, I'm looking at get daylight a little bit, and I see these white flashes. It looks like something's flashing. Well, he scooted all the way out on the limb, and he's got on these bright white, brand new tennis shoes, and he's waving his feet back and forth. And so I, I finally said, Tommy, quit. What? Shh. I didn't hear you. Shh. That went on for about five or six, eight minutes. And I finally said, oh, son, get out of the tree. There ain't a deer within 10 miles of here right now. About that time, a big old six point stood up about 100 yards away and said, yes, I am. <laughs> And I shot him and I said, that's the only deaf blind deer within 10 miles of here. <laughs> I want you to understand, if you're going to reach people with the gospel, it's just like fishing or any place else. You ever try to fish off a dry riverbed? There's nothing there, right? You, you got to be where people are. You got to find a fish. You got to find what you're looking for, how you're going to do it. What are you going to use for bait? Well, when you're, when you're winning people to Christ, you understand they're a lot smarter than animals and stuff. We're, and we're not trying to fool anybody. And you've got to tell them the truth. So you're going to have to figure out that. What works for you? What works for you? I, I don't have a history of saying, well, I grew up in church and my mother and father were godly. They were good people, but we're all heathens. We didn't get saved till later in life. Nobody came after me. I walked into a church and heard the gospel preached. Okay, not everybody's going to do that. We're not going to get them all in here. Matter of fact, if everybody in America that was saved or born again or says they are, went to church next week, we couldn't put them in every church no matter what denomination it was. But... He's going to tell you about, about John. We start using the proofs of the Scripture. How do you know this is the truth? How do you know that's the truth? Well, I take the Word of God, tell Him what it is. I can take the things that the Scripture teaches. Israel's a real place. Jewish people are real. Every, everybody with any kind of history at all, the Romans and everybody else, all recorded Jesus' life outside there's, there's the gospel and all the personal testimonies. And Paul would say when he's writing that there's still more than 500 people that are alive today who were with me. Okay. So you got, he had all, I don't have that. I just have the word of God in my testimony. And here's the deal. All right. When I go to buy a car, I'm real funny about this. I asked the guy, the great lady, whoever you're selling, what kind of car do you own? If they say, well, I don't buy the car kind of that I work here, then why would I trust you for selling these to me? Are y'all like that? You say, well, you know, I work at the Toyota place, but I really don't care for them. I've got me some kind of kind. I don't care what it is. I expect them to, to carry through what they got if they're trying to get me to do it. If we're going to win people to the Lord, Mark's going to tell you the first thing the Lord did is he conformed to every way and every statute, every rule, every expectation of what God had for him to do in the world. Just like a servant would. Think about Joseph going to Egypt and Potiphar buys him. And he, he don't say, well, I'm not doing it. I'm the favored son. No. And that's the picture type of what John Mark's going to tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's have a word of prayer.
Father, we thank you for the love of God. Thank you for the Christ who's willing to conform to whatever it takes to become the Savior that we needed. Suffering, Lord, submitting himself to the rules of people. And Lord, not resisting any of those things, but willingly lay down his life for us. We thank you, Father, he has the power to raise it again. And because of that, the power to raise us. And that's the gospel that we preach, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray it in his name. Amen.